Okay, kindly turn with me to Romans chapter 9. What I want to do is cover the entire chapter today by reading it. And what's going to happen in the rest of the book of Romans, um, in, in a large way, is not that it moves away from doctrine as much or uh, completely, but it does move away from doctrine more than it has these first eight chapters, where there was serious verse after verse of doctrine. Now we get into the application of that doctrine, and um, it's very important for us, but in getting in the application of the doctrine, we can cover more scripture, and maybe, I, I somehow doubt, because of my pace through scripture, but maybe we can cover the rest of the book of Romans before July. So I want to read the entire chapter, and then we will discuss it as a whole. The Bible says in Romans 9, verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. This is the Apostle Paul. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and continual grief in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. My countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Now just, that is clear that it is saying that Jesus is the eternally blessed God. Um, no debate on who Jesus Christ is, and people want to argue and argue and argue and argue over it all the time. I just saw a video recently about a guy trying to give a uh, very historic, scholarly proof that Jesus isn't God, and it's, it's very, very tragic. Verse 6, but it is not that the word of God has no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel... Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, who are the children of the flesh? These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac... For the children not yet being born, nor having doing or done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of uh, God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing form say to him who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had pre prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. 
as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom. And we would have been made like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to the righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness had not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at a stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's pray together. Lord, please illuminate our understanding by the quickening of your Holy Spirit upon our conscience and especially in our hearts. As your word is revealed to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what's interesting about this chapter is that this is an immensely debated chapter. As some of you probably know, those students of the Bible, in regards to Reformed and Armenian theology. Um, I think, Preston, can you turn this up just a little? I think all the people in the room has brought it down from the first service. I do not want to fall into the trap of defending a position um, rather than trying to bring apart, or excuse me, bring out the Word of God in this portion of Scripture. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm so choosy. Is that too loud now? Just down a little, Preston. Thanks, man. They have such a difficult job dealing with me. Please pray with him on a daily basis. There's debates. Um, uh, by the way, I am neither re Reformed as it is um, widely known today or Armenian. Neither is Calvary Chapel. Um, because Armenians don't have it figured out and Reformed people don't have it figured out. And uh, to claim a certain position, um, I think, would uh, uh, categorize me into many different beliefs that I do not hold. For example, I believe the doctrine of double predestination is a heretical doctrine. I believe that with all of my heart. I do not believe God creates people for hell without ever giving them the quickening to be saved. I do not believe God creates people for hell without ever giving them the opportunity to be saved. And I think it is an utterly ridiculous doctrine and I actually believe that the scripture that they use the most for such a doctrine, such as double predestination, here in Romans 9 is that scripture. Uh, vessels of honor, they say vessels of honor means of heaven, and vessels of dishonor means vessels of hell. What an incredible hermeneutical leap to say such a thing like that. Vessels of honor is not talking about heaven, Honor is not a synonymous word with heaven. And vessels of dishonor, it, dishonor is not a synonymous word with hell. And I'm doing the very thing I said I wouldn't do two minutes ago. I, I did, I did want to say that to say what is incredibly sad about the 2,000 year, really more of a, of a, a five, 600 year debate regarding soteriology, that's the study of salvation, how we become born again, has centered around Reformed and Armenian theology. 
There's many theologies, by the way. There's Anabaptist theology, there's Wesleyan theology, there's Armenian theology, there's Catholic theology, there's Reformed theology, and the list goes on to a few dozen theologies. Um, What's sad to me is that the beauty of Romans 9 has been tainted with this debate. When in fact, the latter part of Romans 9, and I do want to jump out of this seminary lesson for a moment and and then get into some really, um, well, into the chapter, but especially at the end, some application that's incredibly important for us. But Romans 9 at the end tells us exactly what Romans 9 is about. In fact, so much so that in verse 30, it says, what shall we say then? What is this conclusion? Why am I saying this, the Apostle Paul is saying? Well, this is the conclusion of Romans 9. That Gentiles, that's everyone who's not Jewish, who did not pursue righteousness, have attained to righteousness, praise God, hallelujah, even the righteousness of faith, oh, not of ourselves, of faith, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness had not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, I lay a stumbling stone in, uh, in Zion, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on this rock of offense, that Jesus Christ will not be put to shame. That's what Romans 9 is about. It's that God in his sovereign choice, that God has every right to choose people other than the nation of Israel. That's what Romans 9 is about, guys. We're missing the point. In other words, and this is very important, and it's, it is the opposite of what hyper-Calvinism says. It's God is not narrowing the road, or excuse me, he's not narrowing the group of people that will be saved to the elect in Romans 9. He is in his sovereign will electing more. He is widening the road of people who can be born again, not just to the Jews, but to the rest of the world. Isn't it ironic that the very proof text of this wrong doctrine of double predestination, this very proof text, the greatest proof text they say is Roman 9, is the very text that displays God's mercy in saying, I am offering salvation to the entire world. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing in Romans 9. He's saying, hey, you guys... You thought you were the only ones that I would choose? Am I not God? Am I not the one who predestines? Am I not the one who elects? Am I not God who has the right to choose? And guess who I'm choosing? The rest of the world. I'm choosing the Gentiles. And guys, this is not a leap. Don't think I'm making this up. That's exactly what the Bible says. I'm... Not only choosing the Jews, now I am choosing the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Everybody but the Jews. So God is saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So Romans 9 is displaying this great mercy of God to move outside of the nation of Israel and to bring the whole world into the family of God very important. I I find it ironic that they are narrowing it to the elect when in fact the election actually means God is going into the Gentile world to choose now. Now, with that said, what he's going to do in the entire chapter other than the application, okay, what is the matter? What am I saying? God's choosing the Gentiles. We just read that. Now he has to deal with what's happening with the Jews and them accusing God of not fulfilling his promises and them accusing God of having unrighteousness because he is taking vessels 
of wrath, vessels of dishonor, and he's making them vessels of honor, vessels of glory, vessels of righteousness, and they're not happy about it. They're upset. Why? Because they're racist. Because they believe in ethnic superiority. What is Romans 9 dealing with? It's dealing with the ethnic snobbery and superiority of the nation of Israel at this time. That's what it's doing. And, and, and guys, if you don't think I'm being honest to text, should I reread the whole chapter again in context? Paul's going on to say, I tell you the truth. I'm not lying. He pours his heart, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief for my people. I wish I could be cursed. What's he doing? He's going back to what Moses said when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. Um, and just to pause, time out for a moment. If you're a visitor and you're like, what's going on here? It's like we just stepped into a Bible seminary. I want a little more entertainment and a pastor running around saying, hey! That's not what we do here at Calvary Chapel. We believe the word of God is powerful and not me. And that's why we teach it. Okay, time on. Time out is over. He, he says, he says I, I want to die. I want to be cursed. I am willing to even go to hell for my countrymen, for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people. And Moses said the same thing. When he came down from Mount Sinai, he had received the Ten Commandments, and he comes down, and they're worshiping a golden calf, and he's like, oh, I wish I could die for my people instead of them being cursed. And he's, he's, he's basically appealing to God in his mercy to, to have mercy on the, these people that he loves so much. In other words, here's what's happening in the next three weeks. What's going on at our church? We're going to cover all three chapters, 9, 10, and 11. Chapters 9 are dealing with the nation of Israel. Chapter 10 dealing with the nation of Israel and chapter 11. Chapter 9 is dealing with the nations of Israel's past to dispel any racist, ethnic superiority and to get them to have their faith in Jesus Christ alone. Chapter 10 is dealing with the nation of Israel's present at that present time and chapter 11 is dealing with the nation of Israel's future, still God obtaining and holding on to the, to the promises that he made the nation of Israel. And we'll cover it in three weeks. And, and, and Paul's going to get into their past in just a moment, but he says, listen, the covenant was given to you. That hasn't changed the glory was given to you. What's the glory? The Messiah would be born as one of the sons of Jacob. Jesus Christ, a Jewish man. Do you know every book in the Bible is written by Jewish men except two books? And that is Luke and Acts. And that was written by Luke. This is a Jewish book given to the world, to Gentiles, because in God's sovereign will, he chose us to be a part of the family of God as well. Uh, there's uh, I, uh, 20 plus thousand verses in the Old Testament and 7,000 verses in the New. In all of those verses, there are 7,000 promises, many to the nation of Israel. And he says, God gave the nation of Israel adoption. They weren't born into the family of God and they forgot it. That's what this chapter is about too. They forgot it. They forgot that they weren't born by blood into the family of God because Adam in the Garden of Eden and Eve disobeyed the command of God and in disobeying the command of God, they immediately became alienated and separated from God and no longer the children born to Adam and Eve were born in the family of God. They were born outside of God's family and God took Abraham and the nation of Israel and he adopted them and they forgot about it. They thought they were born into it. No, they were adopted. They had no rights to be in the family of God. Neither do we. And let us not make the same mistake in forgetting it as well. 
So you were given the adoption, you were given the glory, you were given the covenants, you were given the law, you were given the service of God and the promises, and they now think the promises are gone. God is not with Israel anymore. I heard a story yesterday talking about God's promises that in early America, there was a guy getting ready to cross a river. There was no bridge. Now, the river he was going to cross was the Mississippi River. And Mississippi River is a big river in America. And by the way, I grew up on the Mississippi River. I used to swim in it. We would fish in it. And it is wide. But one winter, the river froze and it had ice. And the guy didn't know how thick the ice was. So he decided to display his weight. And he got on all fours and he began to make the long journey across the wide river. And as he was going across the river, going very slow on his hands and knees, he heard a thunderous noise behind him and an entire carriage of horses and a wagon flew by him on the river and the guy was singing a song, true story. And he made it to the other side, the horses. The guy who was crossing with the horses knew exactly how thick the ice was, and he knew it could carry the weight. By the way, you can drive a semi-truck on three feet of ice. Which people are we? Which people are the nation of Israel? Do we believe in the promises of God and they will never break? And are we going to cross the river of life with confidence or are we just barely getting by on our hands and knees? Because the nation of Israel, they think the promises of God are finished. They're like... He's done with us. His word is null and void. We have no confidence in God anymore. The nation of Israel is not the only ones who are chosen. God is choosing the Gentiles. And Paul is going to remind them they were not chosen because they were special. They were chosen by the mercy of God's sovereign will. So he goes on. He says, but it's is not that the word of God has taken no effect. The word of God is still true. The word of God is still powerful. And it's still um, filled with God's promises. And God's promises will never be null and void. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now he's going to get into a history lesson. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all the children because they're the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your, she, your seed shall be called, that is, those who are of the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. This time all will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah has conceived by one man, even by our father, for the children not, yet not being born nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand... Not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So somebody read that last part in a seminary. I also heard this yesterday. And a very famous scholar was the teacher. And he said, I have a problem with this verse. Esau I have hated. And, and the seminary professor says, yes, I have a problem with that verse too, except my problem is not the same as yours. And the teacher said, your problem with the verse is how could God hate Esau? My problem with the verse is how God can love Jacob. Guys, it's a greater miracle that God loves us than him not choosing Esau to be in the lineage of the house of Israel. Which, by the way, it's not saying that God actually hates him. It's saying God hates him to the degree that he is rejecting him as being one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. He has refused Esau. He has cast him aside. And the word hate there is the, the casting aside with violence is the idea. So, but here's the lesson. And, 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 and if you're thinking... I hope you are as a, as a proper Bible student, as a proper Christian. How can I apply this to my life? We need to get over tribalism in Kenya. 
If you think because of your tribe you are superior to another tribe, you are falling under the same trap as the nation of Israel, and it is nothing short of wickedness and evil. And, and, and if you're there, it's like, yes, tribalism, listen. If you've ever had this kind of rhetoric, you need to change your vocabulary and more importantly, your heart. Because I've heard things in Kenya as an outsider look, looking in. For example, and I may get my tribe wrong, so I, 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 forgive me if I'm getting it wrong, but I, I think I have heard people say, oh, you have to watch those, is it Kalenjin or Kikuyu women? Because they love what? Money. Is it Kalajin or Kukuyus? Kukuyus, oh. <laughs> Do we have any uh, Luo women in here? Any Luo women, Luo women? You're not admitting it? There's nothing wrong with being one. Do you guys like money? Oh, so it's not just Kukuyu women who like money. What a ridiculous thing to say. Oh, those Kukuyus just like money. Everyone in this room battles with not loving money. Every one of us. Everyone in this room was born into original sin. No matter what tribe or what race you're a part of, we are all in the same boat, as it were, a boat that desperately needs saving Jesus Christ because we've been caught in a storm of sin, and the sin is personal. We fall under the same traps that they do. And, he, and, and, what, and what he's saying is saying, oh, you think all Israel was born? Israel, even though they were born as children of Abraham? Is Esau part of the nation of Israel? No, and he is a son of Abraham. So it is not because carrying on the ethnicity of Abraham that makes you chosen of God. God rejected Esau and he chose Jacob. And God has every right to do it. Now don't for a second think, as this debate continues on, that him choosing Jacob and rejected Esau means salvation. That is not honest to the text. It means he chose Jacob to be a patriarch of the nation of Israel and he rejected Esau as a member of that nation. But this is the proof. You can be born a child of Abraham and not be part of the nation of Israel. That's the point. It's not because of their ethnicity that makes them chosen of God. It's God's sovereign choice to call whom he calls and reject whom he wills. And then they say, okay, so what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say then, why does he find fault? In other words, if God is completely in control of our hearts, then why does he have fault? Why does he call us sinners? That is an excellent question. And unfortunately, people get it wrong that God is shoving his hands into us, making us robots. That's not what it's saying. And the example given should prove exactly what the scripture is saying according to the rest of the story. Please listen, let me repeat that. The example given on God having sovereign power over the hearts and minds of his creation should give us an understanding as we read the rest of the story. Where is the rest of the story? In the book of Exodus. What is the example given? Pharaoh's heart. Do you know not just in the story of the Exodus, but 
20 different times in the books, the book of Exodus, it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. 20 different times. Do you know 10 of those times in the book of Exodus, it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart? And 10 different times in the book of Exodus, the other 10 times, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The reason why it doesn't share that with us in Romans 9 is because the point in God hardening Pharaoh's heart is the only point that needs to be given in Romans 9 because it says God has every right to harden people's hearts if he wants to. But we get the rest of the story as you combine Romans 9 and you combine Exodus and the story is this, that God did not harden Pharaoh's heart first, it was Pharaoh who hardened his own heart first. And when somebody rejects God, when somebody alienates, separates, rejects God, separates themselves from him and says, I will not serve God. Do you remember what Pharaoh said? He said, who is this God that I should serve him? Whoa. Who is this God that I, how about the God that fashioned you in, his, in your mother's womb, Pharaoh? How about that? And he rejects him. This is what the scripture is doing. It's saying, do you think God's not in control of the, uh, of the wicked? Do you think God's not in control? Not saying that he is responsible for their actions, but he has every right and he has the power to destroy them, to harden them, and to cause them to fulfill his purposes. You know, uh, in other words, there is not a president, there is not a king, there is not a politician, there is not a senator or governor that is not under the sovereign hand of God. And as much as they have the free will to reject him, as Pharaoh did, God has every right as God to harden them in their rejection. And he does. It's amazing to see the different stories over time that show God's sovereign hand over his creation. China, for example, has been very hostile for hundreds of years in Christianity. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the emperor of China was getting tired of Christianity growing in China. And he came up with a plan to give Christians the job, which is one of the lowest jobs in their system, their caste system. And in this job, it would separate all the Christians who were part of these underground churches throughout the nation. And he made them postmen, male people. So he took all these Christians, he divided them thinking they would die if they're divided, and, uh, and he gave them the job of postman, which is going up to everybody's houses in China. It was in the last uh, 200 years in the Eastern world, the largest revival that the Eastern world has ever seen, because he took all these people, separated them, and then took, they went to everybody's house delivering the mail. And guess what they did when they delivered the mail? They shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And millions of people got saved in a 20-year period. Do you not think, can you imagine how dumb that emperor was? He's like, oh, I got an idea. It's brilliant. Utterly brilliant. Here, here's the idea. Let's spread the Christians out and then let's give them a job that goes to every single person's home in the, in the nation. Do you think God was not in control of that situation? He's the one who put that idea in his head, hardened his heart against any reason of how stupid that idea was because God is sovereign over even the wicked world. 
That's what Romans 9 is saying. It's not saying he created hell to throw all the vessels of dishonor. He's saying the wicked world is under the sovereign hand of God. And he, he, the, 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 heart, the king's heart is in the hands of the Lord and he turns it as the rivers of water are turned. Think of Absalom. Do you know who David's advisor was? David's advisor was, the Bible calls him, the smartest man in the world. Can you imagine that being said about you? His name was Ahithophel, smartest man in the world. Can you imagine somebody coming up and be like, hey, that's the smartest man in the world? I can guarantee you they won't say that about me. But Ahithophel, apparently the smartest man in the world, um, Ahithophel is very upset because his nephew, Uriah, was murdered by David. So as soon as that strong, gorgeous, handsome man, I'm not saying gorgeous because I've seen him or I have any type of homosexuality in me. It's because what the Bible says, long hair. It says, can you, I mean, what did this guy's feet look like? If I took my shoe off and showed you, guys, you wouldn't be like, oh, his feet are so beautiful. But the Bible says that from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, he was beautiful. He was handsome. So he wins the people with his charm. Ahithophel is not dumb enough to be won by charm, but rather he hates David now. David leaves the, um, uh, uh, the camp or excuse me, the, Jerusalem, he's driven out by the, the, the army that Absalom has now won over. It's only David's mighty men now. And, David, and Absalom sits down. And he says, okay, I need advice. What are we going to do? Ahithophel, what's your advice? Smartest man in the world? Yeah. He says, your, your, your father is a mighty man. He's a man of war. If you don't chase him down right now, he will regroup and he will plan a strategy and you will not be able to stop him because he is a man of war. He's the best warrior the world has ever seen. Go get him right now. Then Absalom looks down at his peers, those his age, which this is a lesson for you young people. Stop listening to people your age only and start getting the counsel of wise and godly older men and your pastors as well. Anyways, that's just a side sermon. I felt very passionately about it. <laughs> and he says, what do you think I should do? David, just revel in your victory. Don't pursue him now. In fact, he's going to hide in caves. He knows the terrain. You won't be able to find him. Just enjoy your victory, and we'll get him later. And it fed into his ego. He's like, yeah, I do deserve this. <laughs> I, I need a little me time, Absalom said. And Ahithophel does something very keen. He says, God has confounded the wisdom of Absalom. And if God is still for David, nobody can stop him. And what did Ahithophel do? He went, got his house in order, and hung himself in his house because he wasn't about to fight God. Can you imagine how keen that is? Can you imagine how clear Ahithophel is looking at the situation? And he says, that was God. God is in the mind and the heart of Absalom, and he is directing him to destruction. Genius. Utter genius. And that's what Romans 9 is saying. It's not saying that God is creating people to go to hell, never giving them an opportunity of salvation. He says God has absolute sovereign power over the wicked on earth to direct them wherever he wants after they've already hardened their hearts against him. Don't be confused by that. And it's right that we should believe in the sovereignty of God, but we should believe in the proper biblical perspective of what that means. And in God's sovereignty, he is not narrowing the road of those who can be saved to the elect, but saying the elect are now going to be amongst the Gentiles. 
he is widening the road of salvation. Not in that there are more ways to be saved other than Christ, but he's allowing more people to come in. Glory, hallelujah, praise be to God. Why? Because we serve a loving God. We serve a merciful God. And he's now shown mercy to the Gentiles. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And I will judge and I will make vessels of honor. So who will you say then? Why does he still find fault? Why does he still find fault? Because people are guilty of their sin. That's why. Same answer it's always been. For there are none good, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O men, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another of dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. So if you, if you read that and you are familiar with hyper-Calvinism, you're like, see, it says that he will make vessels of dishonor and he's prepared them beforehand. No. The point of him saying that is he has every right to harden Pharaoh's heart. He has every right to confound the wisdom of Absalom or the Chinese emperor. He can take that vessel of dishonor and continue to mold it into dishonorable vessel. But the point of the matter is this. He is taking the children of dishonor. He's taking the children of wrath and he's making them children of righteousness and children of love, and that is the Gentile people. That's what he's saying. Don't confuse it. He says it right there. And so all, or excuse me, where, where am I here? He says, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles only. Those vessels of dishonor. Those vessels of wrath. Those nations all through the Old Testament that God labeled as pagan nations, idolatrous nations, vessels of honor nations. And he goes on and he gives the prophecy, I will call them my people who are not my people, talking about the nation of Israel. And then he goes on with the nation of Israel and says this, but I still have chosen you. I have not left you. My covenants are real. My promises are real. I am not breaking my covenant with you and starting one with Gentile. I am keeping my covenant with you and I am starting one with the Gentiles. And that's why I said, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. He's talking about the tribulation period where all the nation of Israel will come to a knowledge and belief and saving faith in Jesus Christ. What shall we say then? What shall we say? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness by faith and the Jews who pursued righteousness have not attained righteousness because they didn't do it by faith because Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to the nation of Israel. That's the point, guys. What's the point of it all? He widened the door of salvation to include the world. The Jews, yes, you can be saved. Gentiles, you can too. But Jews, you cannot be saved by your righteousness. And the the offense is this. You have no righteousness. Christ is your righteousness. And that's why Gentiles are getting saved. They know they're pagans. And now they've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you need to believe that it's not your ethnicity that caused you to be saved but it is your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the lessons of Romans 9. So three applications here. As the worship team comes up, three applications. So number one, you can be amongst the people of God and not be a child of God. Let me repeat that. You can be amongst the people of God 
but not be a child of God. Just because you're a member of this church does not mean you're born again because of your membership. You can be with us Sunday after Sunday and Sunday. And guys, here's the real issue of it all. Religion is destroying people's hearts and minds and nations and cities and families. This religion is like, you work hard, you'll be connected to God. And we have a big job to do, church. You have a big job to do. Just next week, hopefully by Friday, we're going to turn in a building plan to the city of Eldoret to approve our drawings for our new church land across the street. It's, it's a big facility. Maybe if we get the digital drawings, I can show it to you in the next month or so. It's a big facility. The sanctuary, Lord willing, I, I, I don't want to presume upon God. Lord willing, when we build it, if we, God allows us, that sanctuary will be a 2,000 plus seater. Yeah, that's, I think it's clap worthy, maybe. I, I do not want a goat farm. I want a sheep farm. That means I want people to be born again. That means you go out and you preach the message that Paul's preaching in Romans 9. He's saying, hey, person here in Eldoret, stop looking at yourself to be right with God and look at the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the message. Stop the guilt. Stop the condemnation. Knock it off. You're looking at yourself for salvation. Look to Jesus Christ. And that is the most powerful message the world has ever seen. That you can take the burden off yourself. And you can put it on the only rightful person, Jesus Christ. And the only person who could ever carry the burden of righteousness. And that is Jesus Christ. And that message will fill up our new church with sheep and not goats. Because people will get born again. So you can be amongst God's people and not be a child of God. Secondly, physical birth does not make us spiritually alive. Just because you're born a Jew, just because you're born into a Christian family, just because you're born a child who is a pastor does not mean you're born again. And thirdly, God's plan includes Jews and Gentiles, right? Did we establish that? God's plan includes you. Does your plan include God? Number one, you can be amongst God's people and not be one of God's people. Number two, physical birth does not mean you're spiritually alive. And number three, God's plan includes you. Does your plan include God? And once again, we hear the word of God. Let us apply it to our lives. Let us meditate upon it today as we go into fellowship. And let's cast all of our cares. Let's cast all of our attention. All of our worship upon the only person who has the righteousness to save us. And his name is who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you what it accomplishes in our life. We thank you for your grace, Lord, that you've put us in our place, that it's not our tribe or ethnicity, that uh, our race that makes us great. We are great because you love us and you save us and we find our worth in you and your love. And Lord, we need you. So please, Holy Spirit, make this message alive. Make your word, your word alive in all of our hearts that we wouldn't go around debating Romans 9, that we would go around rejoicing in Romans 9, rejoicing in the beauty of this chapter. I pray for that, Lord. And I pray you would receive our offering as we give it in love and in faith and as we expand your kingdom here in Eldoret and in Kenya and on earth, using this given today to share the gospel. I pray tonight people would get saved at our outreach event as we watch soccer. 
And I pray you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.